Uh, welcome to our New Year's Eve program. Those of you who've just arrived today, um, you might not be familiar with the format, but we've been having a meditation retreat for a week, and at this time uh, I've been endeavoring to answer questions about Buddhism and meditation practice, and we still have quite a few unanswered questions, so I'll use this last session to try and answer them and at the same time give you some teachings and it's a time to uh, you know, reflect on the Buddha's teachings, how you can use them in your life for finding more happiness, more understanding and tonight being New Year's Eve is a good time to think about your life leaving behind the old year, starting the new year. Of course, this, we say, is just uh, a convention. You know, for convenience, human beings, we have a calendar so that we can agree on things, dates, start of the week, end of the week, start of the year, end of the year. It's convenient. But in terms of truth or Dhamma, obviously, our life is just moment by moment, minute by minute, day by day. You, know, you don't have to measure it by years, months, days. If you're practicing mindfulness, you're coming closer to the real Dhamma, which we just chanted is Akaliko. So it's timeless. So the truths that the Buddha pointed to that we're contemplating following, practicing, they're timeless. And that's because you know, truth is truth. Whether The Buddha said whether a Buddha arises in the world or doesn't arise, there's no Buddha in the world, the truth is still the same. And the Buddha's job is to reveal the truth, what is already there, but just help explain it to us. We are not as wise as the Buddha, so we require a teacher to show us the way to live more peacefully, more successfully, and to find true happiness. So he compared it to um, somebody walking through the jungle, looking for an ancient city, and they're using a machete or something to slash away the all the undergrowth, and then eventually they come across this city in the middle of the jungle. That's always been there, but now it's like the first person is rediscovering it. He said the Buddha is rediscovering the Dhamma that's already there uh, and teaching us, bringing it to teach us. And the truth is timeless. And people in the time of the Buddha are no different from people today. And the world has changed, technology, the environment, number of people in the world, politics, all kinds of things have changed. But fundamentally, human beings haven't changed. We have a body and a mind, and we experience suffering, but we can also go beyond our suffering and find happiness. And that hasn't changed, whether it's 2,500 years ago or today. So the Dhamma is timeless. So, one question tonight. The suttas place some importance on heedfulness, especially the Buddha's last words. Can you please explain heedfulness and how to develop heedfulness? What is the difference between heedfulness, mindfulness and concentration? Well, as you pointed out, we sometimes chant the Buddha's last words. Vaya um, Dhamma Sankara Ampamadena Sampadeta, we 
the Buddha said, reflect on the impermanence of all conditioned things, which means body, mind, the world around us. All formations are impermanent. That's the nature of this world and our life. So, having reminded yourself of that, he said, practice on with heedfulness or be heedful and bring the practice to completion, meaning completely understand the true nature of physical and mental phenomena, nama and rupa, to free your mind from suffering. So it's quite useful <coughs> to have this word apamada to, uh, it's a cover or covers so many things. Um, it's broader than say the word mindfulness although often they, they sometimes seem to be used interchangeably. But mindfulness has a more specific meaning. It means presence of mind, knowing in the present moment. And with mindfulness you're knowing something. There has to be an object. So you know the breath. You know some aspect of the body. You know... Um, mental state arising, passing away and so on. You direct your mindfulness to something. Heedfulness is broader. Apamada arises through listening to Dhamma, meeting teachers, <coughs> hearing Dhamma, reading Dhamma, reminding us of the truths of life. So how did the Buddha's own quality of heedfulness arise? It came when he went out of the palace into the city and he saw sick people, old people, people, corpses being prepared for a funeral, things he'd never actually seen before because he had a very protected childhood. And then he suddenly had a very shocking introduction to life, old age, sickness and death. And this brought out a real sense of urgency, thinking, oh, there must be something I can do to go beyond the kind of normal suffering human beings have. And then the last sign he saw was a samana, a monk, obviously not a Buddhist monk, because the Buddha hadn't become the Buddha yet, but a monk, shaven head with robe, walking through the town, collecting alms, symbolized the spiritual practice that we um, aspire to, to find inner happiness, true happiness. And these were the kind of four symbols or signs that brought up a sense of heedfulness in the Buddha. You know, I mustn't just let my life slip by, be complacent, just enjoy the pleasures and the success I've found so far in life because he was very wealthy, very uh, comfortable upbringing with power, wealthy, well-known, ev had everything that you might want from life. We all want to be wealthy, famous, have all the comforts that the world can bring us, have power, have status. He had all that, but then he realized it doesn't, still doesn't stop you getting old, getting sick, facing death, doesn't guarantee that you will have a mind free from stress. You still can get angry, fall into states of greed, disappointment, despair, and so on. So for him, this led to the rising of, you might say, apamada, heedfulness. And he started to think, I must look after my mind better, and I must go out and really use my mind to come to understand the truth, to free myself from these kinds of sufferings, which ultimately led to Nibbāna, the end of suffering for him. So apamada, heedfulness, applies to the whole practice, not just mindfulness, but directing your mind to having heard the Dhamma, to bringing up Dhammas in your mind. And that can be a variety of different qualities, can't it? Mindfulness, but also Wiriya, effort, persistent effort, sadha, 
the conviction in the practice that you're doing and in the enlightenment of the Buddha and the Sangha, other people, men and women who've practiced and become enlightened. If you have sata, you have a conviction in them that they have freed themselves from suffering, experienced true happiness. With the practice of mindfulness, we bring up, with continuity of mindfulness, we experience states of samadhi states of the concentration and non-distraction. And samadhi is a foundation and a stable platform to contemplate, to develop wisdom, understanding. When your mind is not distracted, you can look carefully at the nature of your own mind, this body, things around you, the experiences you have, and you can understand them because your mind's not distracted, and that's the role of the samadhi. So sati leads to samadhi, but sati and samadhi all fit within apamada, and apamada is broader than that. Practicing sila, morality or precepts, is the practice of apamada. Developing right view, listening to the Dhamma, respecting the Dhamma, giving it value and importance, this is apamada. So they say somebody who meets an enlightened teacher, a wise sage, a wise person, but doesn't listen to them, doesn't take any notice. They're somebody without heedfulness because they're giving, getting given good advice, but they don't take it. They don't think it's important. <coughs> when we get distracted, we go off pursuing all kinds of unrelated things that don't help us understand the Dhamma. We get caught up in you know, the, the affairs of the world, family, work, seeking pleasure. That could be just in a, you see that in just a few moments, like when sometimes you say, oh, I should really meditate today. And then you say, nah, too busy. <laughs> you could say, oh, you lost your heedfulness. You're starting to put aside the Dhamma practice for maybe you say, oh, I'd rather watch the soap opera <laughs> on TV or you know, go and chat to my friends so you don't meditate that day. You could say, mm, lacking heedfulness. And of course, if you lack heedfulness, it becomes a habit. After a while, well, you never practice the Dhamma, you never listen, never meditate, maybe never think about precepts, never practice the different practices the Buddha encouraged, so your mind just fades away from the Dhamma and becomes maybe more confused, more stressed. And then one day you, you realize, oh, you're very close to the end of your life and you haven't used your time to practice Dhamma. And some people have that and they feel regret, like, oh, why didn't I put more effort into my Dhamma practice when I was younger? When we're young, we're always saying, I'll do it when I'm older. <laughs> when we get old, we always say, why didn't I do more when I was younger? What's the reason for this? Uh, we didn't keep heedful. We weren't careful, conscientious. We weren't reminding ourselves to practice. So the Buddha said, Apamada, heedfulness leads to the deathless, which is Nibbana, where you see the Dhamma, understand the Dhamma, Heedlessness, or pamada, leads to death. Your mind dies from the Dhamma. So even though you're physically alive, your mind is not open to the Dhamma, and so suffering comes in. You don't see your own attachments, your cravings, so you don't do anything about them. You follow them and then end up in stress, suffering. So a heedful person is always looking back at their mind, practicing mindfulness and reflecting on the Dhamma to free the mind from suffering, from dukkha. That, that you might say that's the result of heedfulness. You're always freeing the mind from dukkha, the causes of dukkha, and then the result is you experience happiness, peace.
question. Uh, I notice when I am doing walking meditation, I walk faster. I seem to concentrate faster and more phenomena arise, such as seeing things melting away on, and so on. But I walk, when I walk slowly, although my mind seems to be more stable, quiet and concentrated, but I don't have any pity, any rapture at all. Could you explain? Well, rapture is this quality of uh, fullness. You feel full, peaceful, content, not bored, not angry, not irritated, not frustrated. So most of us have been experiencing over the last week lots of frustration, restlessness, boredom, and you could say the pity wasn't there. Pity comes as you put more effort into your meditation and mindfulness becomes more continuous. Whether you're sitting or walking meditation, you become more joyful. The meditation becomes enjoyable. Physically you feel better, you have a sense of well-being. Mentally you feel light, happy. So pity is a very valuable thing. Um, still a temporary experience of mind, but it's, it's the food of the mind and gives us mental nourishment so we keep practicing. And you have to see when you're practicing correctly, you might notice pity arising from listening to Dhamma, contemplating Dhamma, focusing the mind on in the meditation object until it lets go of distraction it becomes very calm and pity arises and you might feel very joyful when no negative thoughts no unwholesome thoughts can come into your mind so say the they say the area pugala the noble ones they're always experiencing some pity all the time they always have some joy some happiness in their mind but it's still, it can be more or less. If they enter deep samadhi, maybe the pity is stronger. If they're very sick, maybe they can hardly feel pity at all because they're very sick and the body has lost its energy. But the pity is always there, at least a little bit, because their mind is constantly letting go of defilement, negative mind states, negative emotions. It's just doing that automatically. For us, we haven't reached that point, so sometimes we have pity, sometimes not. But as you have practice more meditation, you get skilled, and it's a skill, you can bring up pity. You can just sit, meditate, and pity arises when you become more skilled in your meditation. As your mind opens to Dhamma, maybe you see something that brings pity. So you see someone doing some good action. Something very simple, like just sweeping, cleaning the monastery, or something like that and you feel pity arise. You see someone doing a good job, an act of service, helping someone, just doing someone, or somebody sitting quietly meditating or walking meditation, pity arises. People used to say when they saw Ajahn Chah just walking back and forth meditating, just seeing that uh, a monk you believe to be an arahant walking meditation, pity arises. So much pity. Even when Ajahn Chah was sick, lying in his bed or sitting in a wheelchair, I used to help look after him for a long time. People every day would come. Some people would just bow at his feet and just melt and all the pity comes up. They feel so happy. He didn't say a word, but they have tears in their eyes. They're so, they say they're so grateful just to be able to bow to an enlightened being, even without receiving a teaching from him. Pity is like that. It's a very nourishing quality. It comes and goes, it's still impermanent, but it's part of the path and part of the result of your practice. So when you're walking, you find a pace that suits you, helps you to be calm, mindful, composed, some people walk slower than normal because that makes them more mindful. But some people walk faster than normal. That makes them mindful as well. You're walking fast. You keep, have to keep mindful of what you're doing. There's no one way here. You can uh, 
adapt to what you find works. And if you become very peaceful when you're walking, sometimes you stop and you do standing meditation because your mind gathers together. You don't want to walk, you just stand still, close your eyes and your mind goes in, deep. So you have to experiment and see what works and <coughs> As you practice walking meditation, you're both developing mindfulness and concentration, but you can also contemplate. So sometimes you're developing insight as well, just the same as sitting. And there's many stories of great monks walking meditation, becoming enlightened as they walk, having great insight, having pity arise, going into samadhi, contemplating, one of the most famous ones, Lumpo Chop, <coughs> disciple of Ajahn Man, who spent a lot of time in very remote forests, walking, wandering between very poor villages up in the mountains of northern and northeast Thailand. And uh, the famous story is walking along at night, and he's holding a candle lantern. In those days, no torch, just a lantern with a candle in it walking along a path in the forest and he comes across coming the other way a tiger big tiger and they say the tigers in those days this is in the 1940s were bigger than they are today because there were more of them and there was less pressure on them environmentally so they were he said it was as big as a horse he meets a tiger like that so he said straight away fear came up. He's not yet enlightened, he's practicing. Fear came up. So he stopped walking and he just entered samadhi straight away. So he's walking mindfully and then the fear came up because of the tiger, so he just closed his eyes, enters samadhi. And his aim was to make his mindfulness on his object, Buddha, so strong that he didn't give in to a thought of fear. It's like a little bit of a battle, internal battle, not with the tiger, with his own mind. Struggling to make sure he doesn't give in to a thought of fear. So what is fear based on? It's attachment to a sense of self, or I might die, I'm under threat, what's going to happen? Doubt, worry, fear. Not to let any of that come out, just stick with Buddha, mindful, keep the mind pure, and letting go of any other thought coming up. So he just went into this state of samadhi and he said he just made his mind so firm, he just completely lost track of time. He's just standing there. He wasn't watching the tiger, he's just watching his mind. He said that's more important than watching the tiger, is to watch my mind. That's where the real danger is. If I'm heedful, apamada, I won't let a negative thought arise at that moment. If I'm heedless, then the fear, the worry overcomes me. So he was determined not to be heedless, just maintain his mindfulness. He said when he next opened his eyes, he's still in the same posture, he's holding his lantern, the candle had completely burnt down, so it's like an hour or two gone. It was completely out, and obviously the tiger is long gone. It didn't attack him. So it's like that, you're walking meditation, whatever arises, your aim is to maintain mindfulness in that posture and not let kilesa, greed, anger, delusion, overcome your mind. Whatever you see, you hear, or you remember something, think about something. If you're heedful, you don't let these negative emotions take over your mind. You don't give in to your greed, give in to your anger, to your worry. So a lot of the practice is very frustrating because you're struggling to establish mindfulness and that's why we get tired of it because we're not skilled enough yet to do it. So we have some mindfulness and then we lose it. These thoughts and emotions come in, then we establish mindfulness again and then we lose it. Back and forth, back and forth. You're doing that walking or sitting or any, any other posture. When I meditate, my mind keeps on thinking up thoughts that keep on disturbing me. 
Can I ignore it? Because every time I try to send it away, it just comes, ignores me, comes back. Can you give me some advice on it? Well, yeah, I think you have many friends here. We're all doing, dealing with the same problem. And there's a few things that can help. One is to develop a skillful attitude towards your own meditation. Try not to build up unrealistic expectations. There's some people sit there and they say, I should have no thoughts at all in my mind. Maybe that's a bit ambitious. Thought will come up. First of all, maybe bring up mindfulness to see, well, what kind of thought is coming up? And to see whether it's a skillful, wholesome thought or an unwholesome, unskillful thought. Because thought is thought. And that might be the next reflection is this thought arises because of causes and conditions. It's karma. But it's not really a self, a person, me, mine, myself. We call it a condition of mind. We say sankara, mental formation, or we just chanted. It's the one who constructs the house. And the house is our life, this attachment to this body and our world that we attach to from our own mind. We kind of construct many things from our mind. So it's that quality of constructing things and thoughts and doing that. But first of all, you're using thought to construct good things so you feel better, useful things. And we can use thought to do many good things in this world and in our practice. Later on, you're improving your mindfulness. Well, you might get to the point where you can actually transcend thought and all your thoughts go and you're just with one object. When samadhi arises, completely non-distracted, just calm with buddho or the breath and all the thoughts have gone. But before you get to that point, you have to train the mind. And sometimes you use thought skillfully to help let go of thought. So you ask questions, you know, this thought I'm thinking now, is it any good? Is it making me feel happy? Is it something I should hold on to or something I should let go of? You, know, you can ask yourself about your own thoughts. You're learning from your meditation experience. And little by little you can discard things better that way. As I'm always saying, Ajahn Chah used to say it's like eating fish. When you eat fish, there's always bones. When you eat a piece of fish, you don't want the bones. What do you do when they get, come into your mouth? You pick them out and throw them away. You don't hold on to them because they hurt if you chew them. You just want the meat. Meditation is the same. The good thoughts and the mindfulness is what you want. It's the meat. The bad negative thoughts that cause you stress, suffering, are the bones. Throw them away. When you're mindful, you can see that, you can do that. When you're not mindful, they overwhelm you. So you have to keep fighting to bring up mindfulness, little by little, over and over again. Keep working at it. When you're very mindful, sometimes you can just ignore thoughts. Huh? Just a thought. <laughs> Laugh at it, let it go. But be careful, because when the mindfulness slips, they go oh, straight back in. <laughs> overwhelm the mind again. If it's like Ajahn Chah said, you know, all the negative thoughts are coming from what we call craving. Craving, conditioning, attachment. Craving, what's that like? Well, he said it's like a cat coming round to your house. Not your cat, it's a stray cat or someone else's cat. It comes to your back door when you're in the kitchen. You open the door, you know, if you give in to your kind of wish to help it, you put milk down. Well, what happens? The next day the cat keeps coming. It'll come back the next day, pouring at your door, saying, I want more milk, give me, give me. So you feed it again, it'll be back later. Give me more milk, give me, give me, give me. As long as you give it milk, it'll keep coming. But if you're strong, and you say, well, this is not my cat, you know, it's someone else's cat. It's not my job to feed it. No, no milk for you. That cat is not going to keep coming back if you're not feeding it. You know, it'll come one day, no milk, next day no milk, okay, it gets the point and it's gone. You never see it again. Thinking is like that. If you keep feeding a certain thought pattern, a habit of mind, it'll keep coming back stronger, bigger, more intense. If you keep 
ignoring it, letting it go, seeing it's just impermanent, it will start to fade. It won't bother you so much, eventually it won't, you'll never see it again. So we use many techniques to do that. Contemplate the impermanence of thoughts, contemplate them as without self. They're not really you, they're just passing states of mind. Already you feel better, or oh, this is not me. <laughs> The thoughts are coming out, you say, oh, it's just not self. You, know, you can teach yourself that until you really see it and know it, and then you can let them go. Please, can you tell us a story about Ajahn Man and his time? Well, you've probably seen there's a big biography out there we give away, so you can read that and you'll get all the good stories. Uh, Jen Man or Lumpo Man is considered like perhaps the most influential meditation master in Thai, modern Thai Buddhism. But it's not always the case. Like when Ajahn Man started practicing, he only had a very small number of people who respected him as a teacher, as a wise teacher. Many people didn't know him or were even suspicious of him. So one of his, the things that people love and respect about him is his determination just to keep practicing medi <coughs> meditation, living very simply, wandering around the forests of Thailand, because in those days most of Thailand was forest putting up with extreme hardship, both for his own practice and then to teach others. And he didn't get put off by people being suspicious of him, criticizing him, being afraid of him, accusing him of being like a black magician or you know, some kind of bad monk or something. Because a lot of people didn't understand the meditation practice in those days. And they had their own views and even sometimes other monks didn't like him and said well, he's wrong, he's practicing wrongly. Nowadays that's all changed through his own bravery, compassion, kindness. And obviously he was enlightened, he had his own wisdom that has shone through. And they say if you want to see Ajahn Man, look at his disciples. There's hardly any left that are actually direct disciples, most of them have died now. but. There's his disciples and then his disciples' disciples. They say, if you want to see Ajahn Man, look at his students, look at his disciples, and you'll see Ajahn Man. But he had great um, wisdom in teaching people, and particularly monks. So he was the teacher of many, many more enlightened teachers who in, in their turn went on to teach others. So it had a huge effect on Buddhism around Thailand and you know he's just very wise at seeing how to get people to practice meditation when you know often people are suspicious of it or don't feel comfortable they don't know how to meditate not sure if it's a good thing so he was quite good like a good a very famous story he was once in northern Thailand with a, another monk wandering and they came through a valley to a village right in the mountains, very poor village who had never seen meditation monks before. And they set up camp. They just have umbrellas with a mosquito net and a little mat just in the forest and they bathe in a stream. And they just set up camp and they started walking meditation, sitting meditation. And the local villagers who were doing their fields and they had a little village there immediately recognize that some people have come into our vicinity and they're camping. So the village headman said to one of his guys, go and spy on them. What are they up to? What are they doing? You know, they're very suspicious. And so this man's peering at the monks through the bushes. And the monks knew that the villagers weren't, weren't suspicious. So for a whole week, they didn't even go into the town for food, into the village for food. They just fasted, just drank water. Every day, people, more and more people were looking in the bushes. What are these monks doing? They see Ajahn Man walking up and down, walking meditation for hours and hours. 
they go back every night and the village headman gets everyone around and says, okay, what were these two guys doing today? Don't know, I just saw them sitting with their eyes closed and then walking up and down, walking up and down. Looks like they've lost something. They're looking for something. So what else do they do? Nothing. What do they eat? They don't. So the villagers thought, oh, this is very strange, and start to feel a little bit embarrassed, like these guys are just living here and they're not even eating, and what's going on? So they got up their strength, their courage, went to approach Ajahn Man and said, who are you? What are you doing? And he said, oh, we're just wandering monks, practicing the Dhamma of the Buddha. And the villagers asked, so how do you survive? Well, we're like anyone, we eat, we drink, we live like this. So what are you eating? Well, we haven't eaten recently. <laughs> can you eat? What can you eat? Well, we go into town with our bowl, go into the village with our bowl in the morning, and sometimes people put food in it. So that's the first thing. They've now worked out monks can be, you can give food to them in their bowl. So the next morning, the monks could go into the town, into the village and get some food. And then they asked further, you know, when you're walking up and down, why are you doing that? Have you lost something? And Ajahn Man heard this, so he said, yeah, you're right, yeah, we've lost something. And the villagers were starting to have faith, because the monks were very calm, kind, patient in their manner, very undemanding. So the villagers think, well, these are very special people. So they're kind of warming to the monks. And they, he, when he said he's looking for something, then the village headman said, so do you need any help? Can we help look for this thing you're looking for? And he said, yeah, you can help. So they said, so what are we looking for? He said, we're looking for Bhutto. So where will we find Bhutto? He said, well, you have to walk up and down. And you recite the name Bhutto, 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 and then you might find Bhutto. So they said, oh, okay, can we try it? Yeah, you can try it. So he got them all practicing walking meditation. Bhutto, 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 Bhutto. And, you know, most of them were just like us. Oh, why am I doing this? My mind is getting all over the place. I feel tired, thinking a lot. What's the point of this? You know, doubt and so on. But as one lady did it, and doing this Buddha, she became very peaceful. Her mind went into samadhi. And when they went back to the village, she told everyone. They gathered round again, and she said, oh, today looking for Bhutto up and down, my mind became so peaceful, I had more happiness I've ever had in my whole life. All my worries have gone, my body was so light and rapturous, my mind was so peaceful, this is the best thing I've ever had in my life. And they all said, oh, next day lots of people were there, Bhutto, 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 because <laughs> they all want the same happiness. So Ajahn Man gradually won over the village. They all started supporting the monks, asking for more teachings and learning to meditate. Some of them had very good experiences. That's one example of how he just used the situation to teach people, but in a very, you know, he really had to be very patient and sacrifice his own personal happiness and comfort to get the Dhamma to those people. And that's one of the things he's remembered for in Thailand is he brought Buddhism to many outlying areas where before they weren't Buddhists. They maybe were spirit worshippers or different kind of what they call animist religions, not really Buddhism, just worshipping deities or gods. And so he introduced Buddhism to many, many areas and made it very the faith of the people very strong. So when teachers like Ajahn Chah came along, People already had a certain experience of Buddhism and certain faith. So then Ajahn Chah, because there's a few of Ajahn Man's disciples who also had a great influence, and Ajahn Chah is one of them. Well, he was able to teach people, kind of continue the, the, the practice and the teaching of Ajahn Man. Ajahn Chah himself, like he went to see Ajahn Man when he was a young monk, wandering to get there. Ajahn Man was living in a monastery. And he met one of Ajahn Chah's disciples called Ajahn Tongrat, who became one of Ajahn Chah's teachers. So Ajahn Tongrat, when Ajahn Chah arrived, he just said, Ajahn Tongrat had never met him before, 
never seen him before, never met him before, didn't know him, just said, oh, Cha Maleo, meaning Cha, your name, you've come. So Ajahn Cha said, oh, is this monk, his meditation is pretty good. He knows my name before I've even said it. You know, once you realize someone's meditation is that good, then you listen to them. So he listened to Ajahn Tongrat, who was kind of one of the monks who assisted Ajahn Man, and then he went to see Ajahn Man, and Ajahn Man gave a Dhamma talk. And Ajahn Chah said the first night they'd been walking for all day, very tired to get there. He was with a group of a few monks. Got there, sat down, had a bath, sat down, paid respects to Ajahn Man, and then Ajahn Man gave them a Dhamma talk. And Ajahn Chah just said the pity, the rapture that came up was so strong, it's like it's just floating. Just floating there, even though he's so tired from walking all day, hungry, tired, didn't feel any feelings of tiredness, no feelings of boredom, restlessness. He said his mind just went into samadhi, it's just like he's floating there, listening to this Dhamma teaching from a great enlightened master. So all the respect came up, all the joy came up, the joy of the Dhamma. Things like that, you never, you never remember and you never forget those experiences. And when he was with Ajahn Man, Ajahn Chah asked him a few questions that he had just to confirm what he was thinking. So he asked him about the monks' rules. He said, the monks have to keep so many rules. It's hundreds and hundreds of my, major rules and then very minor rules. It's probably more than a human being can really remember and practice properly every day just by remembering each rule. You kind of feel almost paralyzed. There's so many rules to remember. Ajahn Man said, well, it's true, there's many to remember, it's a, it's a very thorough training, but really there's only one main rule to remember, and that is you have to look after your mind all the time with the qualities of hiri and otapa. Hiri is like shame, otapa is the fear of the consequences of wrongdoing. So not wishing to do something that will bring you suffering or suffering to the others, to others. If you have those qualities, sense of shame and sense of fear of wrongdoing, then you'll keep all the rules almost automatically because you'll be very careful. Or you might say heedful, apamada again. You know, before Ajahn Chah said, understanding that, it's like he got this understanding. Before you do anything, always think, is this the right thing to do? Before you say something, do do something, think about it. What consequences is this going to have? Is it going to hurt me, hurt someone? Is it, is it going to help me let go of some of my mental defilements or is it going to increase my mental defilements? So Ajahn Man, very helpful, just helps direct Ajahn Chah to a very s simple practice, but actually the whole of the monk's discipline comes out of this one practice. He had another question, I seem to remember, he had one about mental states, thinking, emotions, how to contemplate them. And Ajahn Man said, just contemplate them all as not self. They're not self, they're not in themselves anything lasting, they don't have any lasting essence or lasting self in them, they're just passing mental phenomena, mental states, they're impermanent. Reflect on them in that way. Ajahn Chah said, oh yeah, that's what he was practicing anyway, he was just kind of confirming that. And obviously many, many other great teachers have their remembrances, recollections of Ajahn Man, uh, much more than I can say now, maybe go and read his biography when you have, ch have a chance. Maybe one more, Ajahn Chah said when he left Ajahn Man's, he went off wandering in the forest, and he was a long way away, I can't remember, but maybe a hundred kilometers away or something. And there's one night he's in the forest, staying in his little camp, which is just a mosquito screen and an um umbrella, so no real protection. And a pack of wild forest dogs came, and they hunt in packs, and they can kill a person easily, and they're very vicious. They surrounded Ajahn Chah, they got nearer and nearer, barking, barking, threatening him. And he's just sitting there, not sure, thinking, well, I'll just have to wait and see whatever my karma is. If they attack me or they don't. And they were all surrounding him, barking, and he said, suddenly, just this amazing ray of light came. 
he saw Ajahn Mun just kind of walk up holding a torch and these dogs just scattered. But of course, you know, as soon as the dogs scattered, that image disappeared. And Ajahn Mun wasn't physically there. It's like Ajahn Mun's Barami. He must have been spreading metta from wherever he was all the way to Ajahn Chah. And the goodness of his metta and the power of his metta just sent all the dogs scattering. So that's one of the blessings of having a good teacher. You know, they can look after you sometimes. One, two more questions. Thank you very much for this opportunity once again. Everything, even though I realize it's... Uh, Well, it's a long way to settle this mind. I learn a lot from being here. I like to know how the monks do not wave their hands in the air when flies land on their faces. <laughs> and how none of the hand... The, oh, when walking, why they have a walking rhythm why one of the none of the lay people have the same walking rhythm as the monks? So that's one question. Well, the monks are pr practicing their rules, and we have a rule. The Buddha said we're not allowed to wave our arms around. So just follow the rule the Buddha said. So also, when you're mindful, you don't have to respond to every fly. You know, if many of you are on your face, well, maybe you have to wipe them off, but. One fly or two, you can just wait and it'll fly away again. That's why we call them flies. Fly in, fly out. <laughs> you just wait, you watch. You don't have to move every time. It's the same with an itch. Say you're sitting meditation, you have an itch. Most people feel, I got a scratch. You scratch, and then the itch gets worse, doesn't it? You keep scratching, it keeps getting worse, you get more restless, it gets worse. Sometimes you just wait and you watch. And the itch goes, the flies go. You don't always have to move and make a big fuss. So if you become more mindful, more serene, more composed, maybe flies aren't such a problem. And also if you have metta. If you have metta, then you just, you know, you don't feel angry with them. You just understand they're just flies doing what flies do. And there's a question, when I meditate, after a while, it feels as if everything inside the skin is like moving like dough inside a food processor. How do you know what it's like to be dough inside a food press processor? <laughs> if I look at the legs or the body, or the head, it's like that. Do I continue looking at the breathing or just feel this moving inside the body? Um, with all these different experiences we have, one thing is always to look at the result. So if you're mindful of the breathing, say, and you're walking, but then you become aware of your body, feeling like dough inside a processor maybe, <laughs> then you can, if you want, mindfully turn to start contemplating that. And you're seeing, feeling the sensations of the body, and it's true, we have a, it's like, a, we, we chant, a sealed bag of skin. So the skin is like a bag, and then all the stuff inside is just like dough, or whatever you want to call it, moving around. I assume when you're saying this, you're like you're having an insight into this sense that these, the dough and the skin, you know, they're not really you. They're just elements, earth element, water element. It's a sense of not self, isn't it? You become mindful of the breath first. Your mind calms down, and you become aware of your body. Then, and you can be mindful of movement, how it feels, the heaviness, the color, the smell, all these things. But you're also having this sense of just looking at the, the body now as just body. 
not me, mine, myself. It's just looking, oh, it's like this. And many people have this experience. Say so you get really peaceful in the breath meditation, you stop thinking about things, you become really bright, happy. Then as you come out of that state, you become aware of your body. And often it's a little bit, well, it kind of brings you down, is it? Hmm. Back out of this nice peaceful state, back with this heavy body, heavy, it moves, it uh, brings you all kinds of sensations, you know, pain, and you know, you've all probably experienced, you have gurgling, something you hit, sit here and you hear people's stomachs gurgling in the mornings, you have air and bubbling up in your stomach, <laughs> you have smells, sometimes not very pleasant smells with your body, you have this feeling of, of the heaviness of the body and the movement of the body and but now your mind is coming out of this peaceful state. You're seeing the dukkha of a body. It's full of dukkha, it's constantly changing and you're seeing this sense of you're aware of the body but you don't feel like you own it and you don't feel like you really want to own it because it feels so heavy and it's a little bit unattractive, it's not very pleasant. So some people, they just want to go straight back to samadhi again, get away from this body. So that's like I was saying with Lumpur Tate the other night, he said he always wanted to escape from his body by just going into samadhi. So he wasn't contemplating vipassana directed to the body, seeing as an icha dukkha anatta, he was just always going to the bliss of samadhi, like a meditation holiday, get away from the, the grind of the body and the daily existence and all the things with the body. And Lumpur Man said to him, don't do that. You have to put up with your body and get to know it better, be mindful of it and see oh, it's unpleasant, it's heavy, it's changing, it's aging, get sick, one day it will die. Get really familiar with your body and the way it is and then gradually you're also seeing this body is not your body because you can't control it, you can't make it be a certain way. Someone was asking about, you know, the other day we're attached to the beauty of the body. Well, you can't keep it beautiful very long, can you? you know, it's maybe a very limited window in your life when you feel you're looking your best. And then after that, it's just downhill. <laughs> you either accept that with wisdom and mindfulness or you suffer. Who wants to suffer? So just accept them. bodies go downhill with age. They don't look so good feel so good, they bring us pain and aches, they get hungry, they get tired. But this is all the nature of a body and you don't have to take all that personally, my body. Just with mindfulness you reflect, oh, the body is like this. It's just dough in a processor. <laughs> or whatever you want to see. Some people it's like a, a robot walking, you know, it's, it's, it's not even, doesn't feel like you, it's just some thing walking down the street. Sometimes they have that feeling. So keep patiently, mindfully contemplating the body and it actually makes you happier when you can let go of it. Like, I remember one lady in Thailand, you know, she wasn't that old, maybe 30, 35, and she came and we had a rule, I don't know if they still have it, but in the monastery if you stay more than three days you've got to shave your head completely. And this is in the time when shaven head wasn't fashion, right now it's a fashion, it's not such a big deal. This is like 30 years ago. And she's like, what? Huh? Got to shave my head, but I just came here to meditate. You can meditate, shaving your head doesn't stop you meditating. She was, it was a big thing, shaving the head or not. But then she said, well, I'm going to be here for a while, a few months, I think. If I shave it, I guess it will gradually grow again. Okay, so she followed the rules, she shaved her head and you know some people found it very distressing doing this but she came back the next day and she said wow this is the most liberating experience I've ever had in my life. She said, I spent all my life fussing about my hair, worried about my hair, washing it, shaping it, going to the hairdresser, all the stuff we do with our hair, that's gone. Don't have to worry about it. You wash it very simply when it's when you got shaven head, very quick to wash, easy to look after, and everyone looks the same. Monks, nuns, lay people, everyone's the same. You don't have to worry anymore about who looks nicer. You don't sit there going, oh, nice shaven head over here, but I don't like that one. 
you don't do that, do you? It's just shaven head, it's just the uniform, the identity of a one practicing the eight precepts, maybe a, a nun or a monk. So your identity changes, you don't get so caught up in these superficial appearances of the body. So everything in the practice is helping you gain more mindfulness, more understanding. You don't have to shave your head, but that's just an example I gave. You can, but you direct your mindfulness to this body and really understand the nature of it. It's impermanent, it's not self. You can't keep it forever, you can't control it. Last question. I had understood that everything in the universe hmm, has its own vibration. A piece of rock or thoughts and feelings are all energy vibrating on a different level. When we humans are healthy and happy and have compassion and metta, we have a higher frequency vibration. When we are sick, sad, angry, we have a lower frequency vibration. What connects the body and the mind? Is it the breath meditation? Is the breath meditation can raise up our vibration? What is the Buddhist view on this topic? Well, someone was saying today, we have a problem speaking about Buddhism in English because it's not an ang a language that has come from Buddhist culture. <coughs> so often we have problems just defining terms. So one of, some of the Thais were saying, if, if you speak about Buddhism in Thai, it's very easy because all the words are there because it comes from Pali and Sanskrit. So it's easy. So just language-wise, we sometimes have issues defining, like the other day we talked about dukkha, suffering, but it's not just suffering, it's broader than that. Vibration, so what do we mean by vibration? Everything in the universe has its own vibration. Perhaps this is something you've read from a scientific journal or perhaps it comes through meditation. One has a feeling that one is experiencing vibrations throughout the universe. There could be different experiences, but and we can describe them in different ways. So one person might describe their experiences being in touch or aware of vibrations. How you can be aware of a vibration in a piece of rock, I'm not sure, um, but you can be aware of the elements in a piece of rock. It's got mainly the earth element, but some uh, moisture, and as we talked about yesterday, space element. That's why you can break a rock apart, because there's also the space element in there between the very small particles. But as we say, a rock doesn't have consciousness. So it's an inanimate object, obviously. So is this vibration just the awareness of those material elements? Or is it something we're putting on with our mind to the rock or whatever else it may be? And what can we know? Or we can know this body and mind through our own mindfulness practice. We direct to know our own five khandhas, body and mind. And what can we know is, the Buddha said, keep looking and you'll find that these five khandhas are impermanent, changing, subject to change. You say, uh, every, all conditioned things are transient, impermanent. Um, what is impermanent is dukkha, constantly degenerating, breaking apart, changing, difficult to be with things that are always changing. Our mood is always changing. It's frustrating. You meditate, you have many different moods, thoughts, it's difficult. Our feelings and sensations in our body are always changing. The body itself is always changing. It's difficult to bear with. And that's one definition of dukkha. It's difficult to bear with, to stay with. So you can know things are impermanent, they're dukkha, and they're not self because you can't ultimately control these five candors and keep them and make them the way you want and do what you want. They go according to causes and conditions, according to karma. And ultimately when we die, they separate. Your body goes back to these four elements. Your mind, consciousness goes 
a way through karma into new birth, but feelings, you know, they arise, they pass away, they stop. Sanya stops. The candles break apart when you die. We say they're extinguished. So when a great monk dies, we say in Thai they say dap khan. This means the candles are extinguished. So they're not self. And you don't have to wait till you die to prove this. You just observe them every day with mindfulness. Feeling, rising, passing away. Change in the body, thought, formations, arising, ceasing. This is vipassana, meditation. So you can know this much. How you describe it, whether you're being aware of vibrations, say the difference between a wholesome mind state, like you said, like metta or karuna, obviously has a totally different feeling, different experience than the opposite, which is anger or hatred. You know, when you're mindful, you see this. You apply mindfulness to a thought of hatred. It's unpleasant. You have an unpleasant feeling. Your thoughts are negative, ugly, destructive. As long as they go on, they cause you suffering. You're unhappy. When you let go of a thought of hatred, what arises is non-hatred, which is compassion. It's peaceful. It's, it's wholesome. Brightness of mind it has a pleasant feeling. So it's just obvious, the more we practice compassion, the more we let go of our hatred, the happier we'll be. But you also have to do this, you have to practice it to really know that. You can't just believe it, you have to do it. So whether you call that the different frequency of the vibrations, or the different experience of the mind, the wholesome mind is bright, peaceful, with pleasant feeling. The unwholesome mind is not peaceful, it's disturbed, agitated, unpleasant feeling. You call it vibrations or feelings or just the state of mind. You know, we can call it different things, but you obviously become more aware as you practice and you can see the importance of letting go of unwholesome mind states. So that's finally answered all the questions for this year's retreat. And we've got a couple of hours left and it's the end of the year. So what we'll do now, because um, you've all been sitting patiently a long time listening, maybe we'll take a break, we'll just pay respects to the Triple Gem. Those of you who need to go home can go home or if you want to stay and have some drink, we have some juice or tea and coffee down below. And then those of you who are staying, we have um, meditation for the rest of the night in here. At 12 o'clock we have more chanting, what we call parita chanting, which is like chanting protections for all of us and for the um, community as a whole, the world as a whole, you might say. Protections, encouraging peace, harmony, kindness between people. We'll do that at midnight and then more meditation and then with 4 a.m. is our morning chanting. Normally it's 5 a.m. but because we've been going all night we'll have it at 4 a.m. for this one occasion. So um, we'll just pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then we can have a break.